Well, grace and peace, everybody. I want to thank you for joining us once again on Bridging the Gap podcast. And uh, I appreciate you staying around and, and, and downloading and re-watching. Uh, many of you that message me, I appreciate your faithfulness and commitment to this ministry. Uh, well, today again, once I, again, I have my friend, uh, Pastor Steve Bratcher joining us on Bridging the Gap podcast. Uh, Steve, we talked some last week about your journey through ministry. And every stop you made, you were, you were and are coming into a trans, transition period where there was already a major figure who had success in their ministry and community. Today, I want to talk to you and, and just take this episode in this time and just to talk about transition, the trials and challenges that you were faced with on day one. Now, in the spring of 2011, we lost a pillar of the faith, as you, you talked about last week, uh, the founding father of Christian Heritage Worship Center in Kokomo, Indiana, Bishop Frey, Ray Freeman. And what a shock that was for so many people that knew him and loved him. Where were you at the time of his passing in the ministry with him? And how did that affect you personally and the body of that church from your perspective? How did that impact? Sure. Well, thanks for having me, yes. uh, Pastor Nate. Uh, yeah, it, it was a it was an, a, t- a turbulent turbulent time for for us and our in our family because we had been living in West Virginia, um, and uh, in October of 2010, my father had passed away unexpectedly, mm-hmm. and um, you know throughout uh, my life, my dad had been. Uh, in the early years, kind of out of my life, but uh, we were able to lead him back to the Lord and grew together, played softball That's together, awesome. and and uh, and so I was in Arizona when he passed. I was at work, and he he had passed, and um, and so 2010 that happened, uh, 2000 in, in October, and then in December, my family uh, we had a, a tragedy in our in our in our family, and then we were told, or I was told, I needed to move back to Kokomo from West Virginia, mm-hmm. and uh, and I was upset. I was I was. I'm not going to say I was angry at God because I think he always has a plan, but I'm like, Lord, I just moved my family six months to, to West Virginia, to Huntington. And uh, and so I was just getting back to transitioning into to what I felt like that we were going to be doing, which was we were the associate pastor, uh, co-associate pastor, I think at the time. And um, and so we were, you know, things were, were going to be settling down a little bit for our family, going to be able to hopefully heal a little bit from the loss of my father. And uh, and then in April, uh, just sudden passing uh, of, of Bishop, and um, you know that was I, I remember the call, remember the the moments, remember everything just like it was yesterday. You know, uh, for us uh, knowing that you know Bishop would always uh, you know say, hey, you guys are gonna have to do better. You're gonna have to do better than I did. I remember thinking as as I was going over to to the house that morning, what would I know it sounds, you know, we've got the WWJD bracelets. I, mine was WWBD. What would Bishop do, right, at that moment? And he would comfort the family, and he would try to look forward and uh, and help that family through that grieving process. And so, you know, that's what we did. And um, uh, But I, I will tell you it was challenging because that, that loss, that hurt, mm-hmm. but the, the congregation was hurting as much as I was. He had been the pastor. We had just celebrated the beginning of April uh, or March, maybe fifty years oh, of ministry and uh, and of him, you know, uh, serving there at Christian Heritage uh, over. You know, I think he founding pastor there for sure. Uh, and, and so all those years and thinking of that congregation that was hurting. And so honestly, I I. I, I Pushed down. Looking back, I pushed down a lot of uh, of emotions with my dad, loss of the, wow. the some of the family things internally, and then you know with with Pastor Freeman, I pushed that down because I knew the ministry had to go on, the ministry had to continue, mm-hmm. and and I felt like it was my responsibility as well as others. Don't get me wrong, there were many great men and women that that helped during that time, um, but uh, you know it was it was tough. It was really challenging to um, to try to lead. Uh, while I heard someone you know preach this message or, or something, lead while you're bleeding, and I didn't realize how much I was truly bleeding in those seasons uh, of my life. Now, since we're talking about transition, I mean, you, you mentioned something that that struck me, and we talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, while everybody else was grieving, you you mentioned in the first session, this is the man who led you to the Lord, 12, yeah. 13 years old, and you, he's the one that said it's time for you to start preaching when you felt like that your calling was there. So here, not only was this a spiritual father, but this was, uh, he almost took on the role as that father you was missing during that time. So 
during this transition time, when did you grieve? Yeah, no, I think it's a it's a great point, right? It, it, it I hate to say I love my dad, right? I love my earthly father um, a, a, as much as anything, and I'm so thankful f- that he was, you know, uh, come to the Lord. But um, from from about 13, 14, 17, 18 on, uh, Bishop Freeman was my father. He was my my wife's uncle, uh, so we were related. We did the family events. He was always the the, the person that I would look to uh, to to try to get approval from. Um, and, and just to just just to make sure he was he was happy. If he was happy, I was I was good. Yeah. Um, and, and so, looking back today, you know, I can easily say I didn't take time to grieve. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I I I think even up till two or three years ago, honestly, you know, it was one of those things. If I would mention him or mention the church or what, I mean, I would literally almost break down um, just because he was that impactful in my life and that loss was still there. And then, you know, you look at the, the transition and everything maybe not a went as well as it could have or should have. I was 33 years old. You went from a 66 year old pastor to a 33 year old pastor. Uh, it made it challenging. And so, you know, I didn't take time to grieve and, uh, that was probably my own fault. I think there were some opportunities that I had, uh, after, uh, that six to eight month period that I could have taken, uh, you know, some time and, uh, Wish I would have listened to maybe some some uh, wisdom that that came my way, but I I thought I can't I can't show weakness because mm-hmm. one of the things that Bishop Freeman was really good about was always being positive. Right. All it was you know it could be raining outside, but he could be you know oh, talking God. about the the flowers that were coming up tomorrow because of the goodness and 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 I know he had bad days, sure. and uh, but we didn't talk about those too much, mm-hmm. and so when I had bad days or those moments. I wasn't, I, I didn't know how to handle it. Mm. And so I think, you know, if I'd have used a little more wisdom, listened to some wisdom, I should say, uh, you know, maybe I'd have taken some time to grieve. But sure. otherwise, it was after after we decided to step down there that I started to. Well, that's why I basically going to the second question here. And not too long after his death, you became the lead pastor. And uh, what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced right off the jump start? Well, I think, you know, the unexpected loss. Mm-hmm to the congregation was, uh, everybody was still in shock. I remember I was placed in the pastoral role, I believe in June, and we had church camp in July. And I mean, there was no choice. Church camp was happening. It was, it was going to happen uh, because that was, you know, what we did. And so everybody pulled together. You know, everybody got together and did it. And it went well. It was a great church camp and uh, a youth camp. And, and I remember sitting in the office after camp and thinking, I don't know what these people are going to do as far as the congregation, because I can't play the piano, right? We didn't have a keyboard player. I, I know some old songs, but I don't know a bunch of old songs. Uh, we had our choir that was great. And we had, you know, Andrea uh, Cole now, Andrea Sexton at the time, uh, you know, she, she was playing the keyboard and doing the best she could. Uh, um, you know, pastor Jimmy justice and, and angel were, were around at the time as well. So that time period was good because they were there, but then, you know, the challenge was eventually they were going to go to Belize, sure. and and we had to figure out that type of, of of transition from a musical standpoint, but also the schedule. You know, many don't understand the the schedule that Bishop had. Uh, we had a Christian school as well, so I, I'll, I'll never forget going through this. It was Sunday morning, Sunday night. You're preaching services. Um, Monday, you're getting ready for Bible Institute for Tuesday. Tuesday, you're getting ready for chapel on Wednesday. Wednesday, you're getting ready for service on Thursday. Friday, you're praying and getting ready for Sunday morning. Saturday, you're thinking if I can go fishing maybe for five minutes. <laughs> so it, it, that, that, was, that was the pace. Now, you know, he, 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 Bishop Freeman was a, a, um, an unbelievable man and gifted in writing and, and uh, study and, uh, and all those years of experience. You know, he, he um, showed so much wisdom. But that was challenging, you know, from a guy who would get to preach, you know, maybe once, twice a month. All of a sudden, you're, you're dropping seven times a week. Uh, and so that was challenging. And then the, the standard, uh, and I, I wouldn't say standard, but you know, Bishop, uh, was regarded so highly and, and should have been, uh, he, you know, should be, should have been honored. Um, but, uh, it was, it was a very, uh, very tough, uh, tough thing to, to deal with when, you know, he had pastored 50 years. Some, somebody may not have seen his, some of his, his bad days. Sure. Uh, and so that made it a little bit challenging as well. Um, and, you know, trying to, again, grieve and lead at the same time. <clears throat> well, definitely Bishop Freeman had big shoes to fill. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's yeah. part of this transition period. Because I know so many people are watching or maybe listening right now that are, 
that are or have been in your boat yeah. or have been in that position or getting ready to get into that position. Yeah. And, and they're they're looking for counsel. They're looking, okay, what am I going to expect? And so th- this scripture jumped to my spirit when I was writing this down today. It was Joshua chapter one and one through three. We know the scripture it talks about the time after after Moses dead. And the Bible says in verse one, this is a new living translation. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am, I am giving them. I promise you that what I promised Moses, wherever you set foot, you will be on land and I have given you will be on land I have given you. Now, here's the most infamous transition of leadership we see in the Bible, in one of my opinions. Yeah. Many people didn't get behind Joshua during this time right. and his style, so to speak, here, and were left behind not to enter into the promised land. Mm-hmm. Now, what are key things we must do to get back to to back it, excuse me, I, I don't have my glasses, people. So <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying to read and do this as best I can. So what are the key things we must do to get people to back us up? And what God has revealed to us, even if it is, isn't exactly like the previous leader. Now going through this, now we look back, this yeah. has been 10 years now. Yeah. Now, now, what would be some things now maybe you would do differently? Sure. No, I, there's a list. I, I think, uh, you know, you, 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 I, the one thing that I did um, after we stepped down um, was took time. I actually traveled that next year, 300 days out of 365 oh, days uh, for the job that I was doing. And Hold was on. In, was you, you work in the WWE? No, I was okay. not in the WWE. That's their I know, I know. <laughs> I was working catastrophe storms. Okay. Uh, and, um, and so for an insurance company, and I remember being in a hotel and, you know, everybody would be going out doing their thing, you know, and, and I didn't partake in that. But I took the time to really understand what I believe, why I believed, okay. because I grew up with Bishop Freeman. I had grew up with his teachings and, and you know, they're spot on. But I wanted to make sure I understood what I believed. But during that transition period, it also gave me time as, as I was in that hotel to look back and think, man, if I would have done this, I should have done that or I shouldn't have done that. And it's an easy path to go down to beat yourself up. Don't get me wrong. Um, but um, for me, it would have been uh, be patient. Mm. Uh, it would have been don't compare yourself to, to the previous leader. Um, you know, sometimes that giant shadow uh, is there for your protection as opposed for you to measure yourself yeah. to it. And, uh, and I didn't realize that sometimes. Uh, and it made it tough. I think uh, the, the uh, just... just making sure I was not uh, forcing things. You know, we, we see so many things that, that we want to do that we feel God wants us to do, and we want to get to there tomorrow. Uh, but we have to have those people with us. And I'll tell you, the people at Christian Heritage were, were tremendous for the most part. They were great people. They supported me. Uh, they had my back. You know, they, they didn't necessarily always enjoy some of the changes that, that sure. we made. Um, and, and I think for me, you know, at 33 years old, uh, it was it was easy for me to um, think. Well, if if Bishop w- if Bishop was here, you know, he could have helped me do this. Or if, and and so it was it was thinking I'm alone. And so getting godly counsel, getting godly wisdom from people that have been through situations like that. Um, you know, I remember Pastor Brozier calling me one day, and I, we talked frequently. I was so thankful for. For that relationship over that period of time, and and it grew obviously uh, to to where it is today. But I remember him saying, you know, in, in this short period of time, you could write a book about the things that you guys have had to face that people in ministry for twenty fifty years, twenty to fifty years have never faced, and um and and it's so true. And I remember, you know, uh, going through the the process of of all of that and thinking, you know, I don't ever want to. I didn't want to step back in the pulpit. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to step back uh, after we stepped down. I didn't want to step back in the pulpit. Uh, I didn't want to do anything in church uh, as far as ministry. Um, because, man, it's one thing when you have... It, it's like when you have your dream mm-hmm. that you feel like God has placed before you, and it doesn't it doesn't work out. You know, In your dream, you always hit that home run to win the game. You don't have the dream where you strike out, right? Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes that happens. And for me, at that moment, 
I, I, I was good. I, I, I thought, okay, I'm done with ministry. I'll go to church. I'll be a good church attender. I'll help in service as far as, you know, in the behind the scenes. I'll go do kids' church. I'll go, you know, I'll sit back. But I don't want to do this because, you know, I, I knew... I knew the way that I left probably wasn't it was definitely not the best way to do it and and uh, and you know it put a, a huge tax on that church and those people and that was unfair for for them but I I just didn't have any way out I remember I think it was Bishop Kevin Wallace in Tennessee powerful man of God and and I remember him preaching just recently he said you know the enemy or maybe it was Ashton Parsley I don't know I can't remember but they were preaching and they said you know the enemy has a way of making us feel like that the situation we're in the only way out is to quit the only thing you can do is quit and I, I know somebody's listening today and they may feel like that you know what all I can do is quit the only way that I'm gonna get out of this is by quitting the only thing that the only thing that that's gonna make this better is is, is for me to quit can I tell you mm -hmm. from experience hold on on, just just hold on get a hold of someone that can lead you godly in a council and and pray with you because quitting is not the answer because now not only when you quit you have to worry about man I let everybody down but then you have to worry about the guilt of that as well and so I'm telling you don't quit don't give up hold on it will get better and I'm thankful you know looking back that uh, you know that God has and through his grace has restored me um, through on my passion, restored my passion, my desire for ministry, and, and removed the fear of failure. I think awesome. when you live in the fear of failure, mm -hmm. you live in the fear of letting people down. When you live in the fear of of not, you know, meeting people's expectations, right. it will destroy you. Right. It will. You'll start worrying about pleasing people more than you worry about pleasing God. And uh, I'm thankful. Uh, I, people may not like me. People may not, may not love me, but. My goal is an audience of one. I'm going to serve and please Amen. him. And when that happens, uh, everything else will take care of itself. You know, Bishop O'Neill says a statement that is, is, is stuck in my mind, um, and it will forever be there. And he says, you can't tell grown folk what to do. And when I hear that statement, it makes me understand not everybody's going to be with me. Not everybody's going to be for you. And so you got to go through some things. And those that are for you will stand with you. Those that are against you, you can't make them do anything. Right. And man, you're, you speaking that word today, I felt that word in, about being patient. Yeah. Be patient. And that is, that's powerful. Yes. You know, I know transition with anything is never meant to be easy. Right. Moving from one home to another, which you're about <laughs> yes. to experience, yeah. which I just experienced a couple of months ago. Transitioning from one job to another job, yeah. all have their own challenges. Yeah. Now, you will be taking over another ministry in this coming year that has a pillar, which we've talked about in that community as well. But the difference here is that he will still be around. Yeah. Now, we may have some viewers listening and watching right now that are getting ready to go through the biggest transition of their lives, which you've already kind of spoken to that to this date. So my question to you is this, how do we embrace change and transition? Well, I think, you know, as I look at the two transitions that I went through, one was sudden and unexpected. Yeah. And it was sudden and unexpected for the people as well. And, and uh, again, I, I'm thankful for the people at Christian Heritage. They were great during all of that, during our time there. Um, but as I look at this transition with Abounding Grace and Pastor Brozier, he's done such a great job of preparing the people, even now. I mean, we're a year, year or so away uh, from that transition. He's preparing the people. He's helped them understand, you know, he's not retiring. He's transitioning to a different role. And, and for, for me to have him there, uh, is is just is huge, right? Uh, the connection points and the wisdom and the experience uh, that that to me makes such a, a a positive thing. I know there's other folks that went through transition and they say, I wish that family wasn't there. I wish these people wouldn't be there. I think that's 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 the wrong approach because there's so much value that they can add sure. in a positive way. So. I, I think any type you deal with transition, you know, change is tough. Uh, I, I've tried to change my eating habits. I'm still working on that. I need to eat less ice cream. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, but anytime there's change, it, it's tough and it doesn't feel comfortable. And it's it's amazing, you know. Uh, Pastor Brozier and I had talked earlier, you know, a, a year and a half, two years ago, about potentially making this transition. Uh, you know, I, I really was like, I I don't know about that. You know, I I, I don't. Honestly, uh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to uh, take it as oh, I was 
taking somebody else's ministry again, right? Um, and and God really dealt with me about that. He said, "There's no ministry that's their ministry. It's my ministry." And uh, and He said, "You don't have a ministry. It's it's my ministry." And I'm like, "Okay, yes, Lord." Um, but I, I know that in that transition and in that time, um, having Him there is important. But when we deal with change, uh, as we're you know, as you mentioned, moving houses, right? Mm -hmm. Changing houses, trying to find a new home, um, having the faith that and confidence that you know where God wants you, yeah. you know where He where you're supposed to be, and it may not be perfect, and there may not be moments where people love you and care for you or like you, and and uh, this year I said, Lord, I really need. A word, I, and every year I've prayed. You know, God, give me a, a specific word or two that I can focus on this year. Um, and, and and you know, we had talked, Pastor Brozier and I had talked for a number of years about potentially transitioning. And it really wasn't until the beginning of this year that I'm like, all right, we're going, let's go. And, and I know my daughter and son-in-law are over there with our grandson, who is just right. perfect. You know, he, he's amazing. And uh, but I, I wouldn't have moved. I know this is maybe they don't watch this. I, I wouldn't have moved for them. I wouldn't. Have, I love them. They're close enough. We can drive back and forth and spend the gas money. I'm moving because that's where God wants us to be at that church. And as I prayed this year, the word that continued to come up was uncomfortable. Mm. And I thought, okay, yeah, that makes sense because we're going to potentially move. But I didn't realize as we're changing houses, as we're transitioning communities, yeah. as we're transitioning back and forth, that uncomfortability, I believe that's what God is calling us to. He's calling us out of our comfort zone to a place of being uncomfortable mm -hmm. because that's where we make the most impact. You know, I preached this message, uh, I preached part of the message about being uncomfortable in Salina a few, few weeks back. You know, when a rubber band gets stretched, yeah. you know, it's not comfortable, but the farther you stretch it, the further it goes, right. right? And so for me, I'm getting out of my comfort zone. I'm moving from from the place where I, you know, felt like I know everybody. They know me. Went to school there, everything, to a place where I don't even know much about the lake, right? Uh, I don't know much about the I don't know much about the community, but I know that's where God called me. I know that's where God wants us. And so having that confidence in that transition, and then knowing that I have godly leadership sure. that I'm able to reach out to, that I'm able to connect with, not only with Pastor Brozier, um, but there's a number of, of great men and women of God that we can have those connection points with, uh, I'm, I'm just thankful for. You know, the difference here, and you mentioned it earlier that, you, you know, you, Bishop Freeman passed away and then you were just thrown into it. Yeah. I feel like this time around, God's really kind of saying, okay, I, I, I challenged you in the hardest time of your ministry life. Yeah. And now I'm going to put somebody in here that's going to help push you, help motivate you, help direct you. And, I, and I'm excited, which leads me to this next point here. One of my favorite stories, characters in the Bible is Elijah and Elisha. Uh, the Bible says that Elisha walked with Elijah everywhere he went. And one day Elisha asked that if he could have a double portion of his anointing. And Elijah told him, if you see me when I leave, you will receive it. And then we see in 2 Kings chapter 2, Verse 15, when the group of the prophets from Jericho saw from a distance what had just happened, they exclaimed, Elijah's spirit rest upon Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Now, oftentimes we see stories of transition. We see division. We see what I call proverbial wall that is built. You're not going to be like this guy. And we see this stuff, which you've, you've brought to that to the point and is put up just to decide if we are staying or we're going to go. But what I love about this scripture is shows that they're, <clears throat> they recognize that same spirit yes. that rest upon Elijah as well as he went on and doubled what Elijah done. Talk to us about the importance of having, we talked about this earlier, but talk to us on the importance about having a godly leadership or a spiritual father. I know that's not, some people are, are I'm going to take a Bishop O'Neill poo pooing on that. Yeah. They, they say, oh, we don't need uh, apostolic fathers in our lives. We, it's not needed for today. But talk to us a little bit yeah. why, how important that is. Uh, you know, I think uh, it, it's amazing. You look at the church today just in general, and you realize that we're missing our fathers. Mm. There's a reason that, that 
if, if, if a man goes to church, statistics say that 97% of the time the family's going to follow. Uh, and I think the reason that spiritual fathership and spiritual uh, 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 leadership like that is looked down upon is because we're too arrogant to understand that we need some covering. That's we need good. the protection. And, and, and I'll tell you, um, I get concerned when I hear people that don't have a covering, when I get you know, people don't listen to that spiritual wisdom because, look, Bishop Brozier or Pastor Brozier, you know, 60 plus years old. Bishop Freeman was 60 plus years old. Why in the world would I not listen to the things that they have went through, just the stories, the, 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 the mistakes? Uh, the the victories, the great things they've done. Why wouldn't I have that? Because not only is it hearing the stories and learning the path, but it is that anointing. It is that 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 anointing that is on their lives. I, I don't know how many Saturday mornings I spend in a suburban uh, uh, going through the McDonald's drive through with Bishop Freeman uh, going on visitation. I didn't hear many stories, but it was being around the anointing. It was being around him. And, and with, with Pastor Brozier, you know, we, 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 uh, we, we don't go to McDonald's much, but we've had those conversations on the phone. He'll talk my battery dead. I may talk his battery dead, but it's, it's, it's being around each other. And when that, that anointing is present, uh, it, it is powerful. And it is, I, I don't know the words necessary to, to explain it, but I know this. When you know your daddy's there, when you know your spiritual father's there, you, there's something different. Right. And, and when they're not, uh, you know, uh, I, I remember, um, I don't know how many times that, you know, as we were pastoring there at Christian Heritage, there were moments that, that I, I needed to hear Bishop Freeman. Yeah. I would put a CD in. I'd just listen to him preach, and then I'd probably feel worse because he was so <laughs> such a great preacher. I'd be like, oh, here's, here we go. But, but uh, it, it was those moments that I needed that because you're, you know, just like we know our Father's voice, right. we know our spiritual Father's voice. Yeah. People, uh, you know, when, when, uh, when, when Bishop Freeman passed away, and I, I, was, I was crushed. I probably took that harder than when my father passed away, my earthly father. And I know that you know, many people are like, I can't believe that doesn't make any sense. He's just a spiritual father. He, he's just your pastor. No, this man believed in me. And same with, with Pastor Brozier. And so, you know, I think, uh, I, I, I don't know, I was just dumb enough uh, or smart enough, I think, really, to realize, you know, I, my ego, I, I'm not worried about that. I need to get under someone that's a covering, that's a protection, that's going to help direct and guide me. And the problem is, you know, many times we have people that are trying to direct and guide us that don't have the experience to do it. I'm not going to go to a mechanic to have my dental work done. And, and, and we got a lot of people trying to lead a lot of people that shouldn't be leading those you're, people because they don't have the experience. You're on it. You talked about, you talked about these, uh, the anointing, and it's so, it's, it's so important to have that rubbing that yes. rubbing rub off on yes. us and you know i i oftentimes I, I say this to my to people who are close to me i often just sometimes walk down two doors down just to when bishop o'neill is sitting in the office just say hey i got a question how how would you respond to and it's just so i know yes. he's probably like nate you know uh i'm busy yeah. you know because he's on like thirty thousand boards right, right. now on, right. in the whole city of muncie no i'm just joking but he's on a lot and but right. there's times i'll say Hey, how would you handle a situation like this? Yeah. Because I know I'm being prepped for my tomorrow. Yes, sir. And so while I've got him here, yes. I don't want to miss out. Yes. And so uh, the mantles are so important. I'll never forget this. And we're going to go to our last and we're going to close this up. But I'll never forget the time when Bishop Freeman did pass away. We went to that funeral and it was packed out. I mean, yeah. we, that church was, you guys' church was a big church anywhere yeah. then. And uh, it was packed out wall to wall. And I'll never forget walking out to my car. There was sitting Mrs. Freeman. And, uh, and, and you think to yourself, what do you say yeah. to a woman who's been married to this man probably 50 years yeah. as well? Now, what do you say to this woman except, I'm praying for you. I mean, we just don't know what right. to say. Yeah. You know, you can't say it's going to get better, you know, because right. we don't know. Right. And so I remember saying, I love you and we're going to pray for you. Yeah. And then she rolled her window all the way down and she looked at me and she says, take up that mantle yeah. and run with it. Yes. Well, some people are listening to that story like, whatever, what's that mean? And, and, I, and I feel the Spirit of the Lord, yeah. and, and even talking to you, I sense that mantle is on your life. And so there's so many people that are just running around, uh, you know, I, I'm going to say it for what the word is, yeah. they're, they're a bastard in the spirit yes, realm. Sir. They're, they're walking around, and you mentioned, and they're doing more harm yes, sir. than good. Yeah. And so... 
Listen to me. Find you a father. Find you a spiritual leader. And I don't care what, if it's popular or not, and what people are saying, well, you know, that's, we don't need that for today. Listen, this stuff is rooted and it will root itself in you. I've quoted Bishop how many times now? (laughs) Three times of his statements. And I know when I get up to, I say things like what he'll say, now we're going to take a, uh, 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 we'll, I'll just start talking like him. In my mind, I'm like, why am I saying this? Mannerisms. But that's what happens. It's that rubbing. Well, and, and, and I think that, that, that what we found, you know, a father also corrects. I, I've been called on the carpet a few times when, back in the day, and, and I remember not enjoying those moments. A spiritual father is not just going to be a blessing. It's going to be a time of correction. It's going to be a time of learning. It's going to be a time of growth. And, and that's when we know we're under the right leader. Yeah, sure. You're right. It's not comfortable. And no. that's a good dad. That's right. You know, it was my dad when my dad would say, Nathan, go clean your room. It was like, well, I don't want to clean my room. Well, there was, there were some repercussions if I didn't clean my room. (laughs) So then I understood the importance of tidying up. Yes. But but saying all that, saying all that, uh, there, Pastor Steve, there's somebody probably watching right now that has dealt with church hurt. We, me and you've talked about church hurt, uh, due to even church splits and it's caused them to walk away or even stop pursuing God like they used to. Can you just pray for them as we close this out right now that God will begin to heal that inner man, that inner person that is broken and confused about their purpose? Absolutely, absolutely. Father, I am so thankful that this platform is here to reach that person that's listening and watching right now. Lord, I know without a shadow of a doubt that the enemy's desire is to separate us from the body so that we'll never fulfill our purpose, we'll never reach our destiny that you truly have for us. But Lord, right now I come against what the enemy's plan is for this person's life, and I believe by faith right now that they are getting ready to stand up again. They're getting ready to dream again. They're getting ready to think they can do it again because they can. The Holy Spirit is enabling them right now and letting them know it's time to get up. It's time to not quit. It's not time to stop. It's not time to walk away. It's time to get connected. Lord, I pray right now that as you've placed us in this person's path that's listening today, that you would place somebody physically in their path that's going to connect them to the place that's going to step the, step them into their destiny. Listen, if you're listening right now, listen to me. I believe that you're closer to your purpose than you've ever known before. And the enemy is fighting you harder right now than he's ever fought you because he knows you're about to step into it. Hear me today. Don't quit. Don't stop. Don't, don't turn around. But you go forward. Stand up in spite of the hurt, in spite of the pain, in spite of the issues that you've seen, in spite of all the mess that's been around. God is getting ready to do something powerful in your life. So don't stop today. This is just a comma. It's not a period. It's not over. Don't write the story to the ending today because it's not done in Jesus' name. My God. Receive that today. I I feel the Spirit of the Lord moving, and I I believe that somebody's touched right now, and somebody's receiving their breakthrough at this very hour. Uh, Once again, I want to thank you for joining us on Bridging the Gap uh, with my guest speaker, or guest, uh, Pastor Steve Bratcher. We'll see you next week on Bridging the Gap. God bless you.